you everyone for joining us 71 and counting episode number 71 um and we weren't sure what to title it coronavirus covid19 um the the the, the thing you just can't escape in the media in the news at the moment and we've we're delighted and honoured to be joined by the CEOs of uh, Craig and Rye's respective uh, professional bodies. Uh, Steve Jameson from, from the College of Podiatry here in the UK and, and Nello Marino from uh, the a, a Pod A. So thank you guys. I know you're not just busy men in general, but busier now than ever, uh, I think it's fair to say, which we'll, we'll come on to. Um, everyone who's watching, please do take this opportunity to you know, write questions. We can't promise we'll get to all of them clearly the numbers are big um we'll get to the ones we can we're probably going to answer a lot of them anyway in the in the general discussion we have but do 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 not be afraid to fi fire questions into the comments and we'll do our best to get to them um so yeah obviously once again guys thank you I know you're super busy um let's talk a bit about just how busy you are um just, just how your life, all of our lives have changed recently, obviously, um, for, for obvious reasons. Can we talk a bit about how your lives have changed? What, what, what does your normal day look like now compared to what it has previously looked like? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pitch that question to, to Steve first, if that's all right. Sure, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, as you say, our lives have changed uh, greatly in the past couple of weeks. Um, it's... It, we are all living in times that we none of us have ever experienced before. We always think from doing a risk analysis that um, pandemic is something that you always make sure is there. But actually, I guess we often think that it's never really going to happen. And uh, in our world right now, this uh, has changed the way that we think about things, the way that we work, the way that we have to support our families, our members, our healthcare professionals in general. Um, and so my day right now is because all of my team are home based now, we've had to close the office. We closed it two weeks um, ago. And so all of our team are getting used to working at home, um, using Zoom and the various um, IT uh, uh, products that we can do to make sure we keep in touch. But, it, but it's because this thing is, this virus is changing so much and the stats that are coming out is so is so um, alarming and changing all the time that we've got to change and adapt on a daily basis. So, you know, thankfully I've got a really good communications team who support and, and help us with trying to collate the information that comes out and somehow tries to translate it into a way where we hope that our members feel that we're getting the information across to them that they need in such a a time where they are all struggling just to get the right information. Um, and so it's a bit of um, deciphering and, uh, and translating really is, is key. Um, I, I think we, we do a daily news um, letter out to all of our members now. It goes out about 6.30 in the evening and it covers everything that's happened that day. Uh, we've, we've now divided it up into the four countries, the UK, so that there are specific things happening in Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales. So we're able to pull out the policies and the processes that are happening in each of those countries to help our members in those countries. But, you know, uh, I'm the first to say that we're learning. Um, we're learning how to deal with this. We're learning how to get our messages out even better to our members each day. Um, and we'll continue to learn and we'll learn by sometimes getting it wrong, sometimes getting it right. And uh, thankfully, and I, I was just saying earlier that we've had lots of positive results from our members today on Twitter saying, thank you for the information you're now getting out to us. It's really helpful. Um, and so, uh, you know, I hope that what we're trying to do and work in a different way has, um, has helped our members, both in the NHS and those people in private practice, because it affects both of them the same, but also very differently as well. And it's about trying to meet their needs um, as much as possible. So yeah, a big learning curve for us all, and uh, I'm sure Nello will, will agree with me that um, no matter which country you're working in right now, which country you're, uh, you know, you're from, uh, we're all just struggling to get our head around all of this and uh, trying to work together to solve some of these problems. Actually, Steve, we've just had a whole lot of very positive comments about your daily emails, so that there are people saying thank you and congratulations for that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I, I received that email myself and um, yeah, it's, it's hugely, hugely useful to come out. And I know, Nello, coming to you, I've 
been following the APOD A's social media channels, uh, obviously from a distance. And you guys are just as good at communicating with your members on a, on a daily basis as best you can as well. Yeah, it, look, it, I think what's um, there's obviously a lot of similarities as to what, what Steve's described. Um, similarly, from a workplace perspective, all of our staff are obviously working from home. Um, thankfully, we were well equipped to be able to do that well in advance of, of this, so that was probably the only thing we'd really prepared for. Um, as far as the changes are concerned, um, Ian, I think the... To me, the biggest change that has occurred, and I don't think it's strictly restricted to us, is this: uh, the pace. Uh, it's the pace of change that uh, we're being required to accommodate, uh, we're being required to adapt to, uh, and we're be being required to deliver. So in that context, uh, we're just seeing every organisation that we're interacting with, whether it be government, whether it be the authorities, um, you know, whether it be our members, the, is the, the fact is that we're required to adapt so quickly. Um, and in some instances, um, things are being achieved that would ordinarily be a, a slow moving beast. Um, things are being achieved uh, at the, the blink of an eye. Um, so, you know, we can look at, look at really, um, I would say, fundamental issues like telehealth as, a, as an example and the introduction of some of, the, uh, some of those um, opportunities even as early as this week or recently as this week. Um, so we're being required to help help our members equip and so forth. Um, I think from a, a volume perspective, uh, we've probably, again, we've seen a, an enormous number of inquiries, whether it be through social media, whether it be through email, whether it be through our phones. We've effectively had about three or four, three or four people. We ordinarily have one person at a time on our phones. Um, we generally manage that load. We have a backup. Uh, we're we're having three and four calls at a time. The calls are extending in length to what they would normally be. Um, so we're finding that the depth of response. So, so if you balance that against the fast pace, we're required to respond quickly but also the, the information and the, con the, the complexity of the information uh, needs to be at a greater depth as well. Yeah, uh, to, to, to that, we'll, we'll talk a bit about the kind of calls you're getting if, 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 if you don't mind speaking to them, because uh, I know uh, a physiotherapy colleague uh, involved with the CASP was telling me that the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy was telling me pretty much what you've just said, Nello, is that an average call to them uh, pre pre global pandemic took three minutes, and most calls now are taking on average twenty minutes. So it's not just the number of calls going up, like you say; it's the complexity and the the time each call is taking. Um, I'm guessing most of those calls aren't complaints per se. Um, but uh, probably worries, concerns, anxieties. Could you give us a bit of an insight uh, as to what the sort of the most common calls you're receiving are? What seems to be the, the, the clinician's biggest worries and concerns? Um, look, it, it's quite varied, to be, to be really honest, Ian. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd love to say that it, um, it pinpoints a whole lot of things, um, but I think it goes across the gamut of... Um, uh, what should I be doing with my practice? Uh, how can I, uh, are there going to be relaxation of requirements for things like CPD and CPR and some of the requirements of registration? Um, uh, how, what sort of government schemes are available for me to uh, find support, whether I'm an employer or an employee? Um, there's a whole range of, of other questions relating to whether they actually fit into those. Am I a sole trader, am I a, uh, a contractor, am I a, um, a business? There is a full gamut of, of uh, questions that are being asked and I wouldn't necessarily pin it on one. If I was to, if I was to focus on um, perhaps the two that might be uh, most prominent is seeking advice about how they continue practicing and if they continue practicing. Um, and so we've, uh, as I mentioned in a recent, um, uh, a recent video that I, I sent to our members was that, you know, we're getting the absolute extremes. We're getting uh, individuals that are asking about 
whether it's okay to, to close their practices. They are genuinely concerned about their, their health and the, the health of their, um, uh, their patients and their families um, from, a, from a safety perspective. Um, and at the other extreme, it's um, how do I make sure I get all my patients seen? How do, I, how do I make sure all these issues are dealt with? I've got patients that do need to see me. So um, I suppose the, um, you know, the, that seems to be a reflection of where it lies. It, it really is the full gamut. And to, to identify one particular issue would probably be unfair. Ian, if I could um, yeah, just follow on from what Nello was saying, you know, in the, over the past two weeks, it has been very much around, you know, what do I do with my private practice? Do I close my practice down? Um, what happens financially to me? What support can I get? What's the government going to do to help me? Um, but actually, you know, we've done a lot around um, uh, promoting what the government's saying and the various grants and bursaries and those type of things that are available to people to get some financial support. But what we've started to see in the past couple of days is much more about, um, I think as this whole virus is landing now, it's much more about the uh, personal protection equipment. So the PPE, as we talk about, not being available um, to all of our practitioners, um, putting our practitioners at risk because they don't have the right equipment. Um, the right uniforms, the right goggles, masks, etc., to care for for patients. And the other one, obviously, which is very much a topic for us right now, is the whole issue of testing um, and whether we should be testing all um, healthcare professionals, um, both from to see whether they've got the virus or had the virus, and whether they're able to go back to work. The government here in the UK is getting a bit of um, uh, slating because of. Um, them not being as prepared around testing as they should, and also not having the the uh, equipment uh, available for those doctors, nurses, allied health professionals who need all of that protective equipment. And so we've started to see a real shift in the number of calls about, you know, do if I don't have the equipment to wear, should I be even seeing a patient type question, which is very different to what we, we were listening to, say, last week or the week before. And I think it's because just of the number of people, uh, number of transmissions, the number of deaths we have each 24 hours in this country and across the world. Um, and I think people are now getting really scared that if they're not wearing the right equipment, then they too are putting themselves at risk, their families at risk, and the patients that are caring for at risk. So um, something that I've done uh, for the past few days, um, I've written a number of letters to the Secretary of State for Health and also to the Chancellor um, here just really querying what's happening with uh, the, the um, equipment for our healthcare professionals and also asking about testing. Um, and I think we've just got to continue with one voice to find that drum to make sure that this is addressed because it's simply not good enough expecting our, our people to go in to care for, for patients when they don't have the proper protective equipment or they themselves don't even know if they've had the virus or um, indeed carrying the virus right now. So a lot, of, a lot of things that we need to start focusing on, which our members um, have really turned to in the past few days. Yeah. An interesting point you make there, which I've definitely noticed, which is go back 10 days and the discussion was very much about just, just what about my business? Should I stay open? Should I stay closed? I'm not saying those discussions aren't still happening, but definitely as we see the numbers rise, I, I agree with you. It seems to be more now about PPE and safety and that of our own safety, our family's safety. So there's so many layers of discussion and complexity. If we could quickly go back to talking about the should we open, should we close uh, I don't want to call it debate, but you know what I mean? Because I know that that's the one I see most discussed on social media. I, I'm sure, you know, like you both mentioned there, you're, you're getting a lot of calls about it. Um, I was advocate when I, when I asked this question. So just before I do, just for context, for those who don't know me, just to make sure everyone knows that I do not have a dog in this fight. I am a private practitioner in, in private sports medicine. And as such, do not consider myself essential. I do not save lives. I'm not a, a one of those great podiatrists that, that are out there that are saving lives. Therefore, uh, as a self-employed limited company, I've completely shut down 
I've seen no patients. This is the second week now, earning no money. So I just want to, everyone to know my position when I, when I ask these questions, just for complete transparency. Um, but let's go back to the big debate. Should we open? Should we close? Back, you know, back 10 days ago, two weeks ago, it feels like ages ago now, but so much has happened. Um, I got the impression that, that both all of, all of your members, both of your members, groups of members, were, were, were just looking to you for the answers. Just tell us what to do. And they almost seemed a little bit annoyed that you weren't telling them what to do. And then when I've seen various messages come out as, as advice has, has evolved, and, and Steve will come to your flowchart in a minute, if we may, and Nello will come to your, your video as well. Um, and you have kind of given guidance um, based on, on governmental sort of um, comments. People have inferred that that means one thing or another thing. And if it didn't seem to be in keeping with what they wanted, then they were angry. So they were angry when they were being told exactly what to do. But then they were being told, so what, you're telling us to close. How can we survive? Or you're telling us to stay open. Isn't that, is, is that appropriate? So I, I feel for you guys. I wouldn't want to be in your position whatsoever right now. Um, Steve, let's come to you and your flow chart first, if we can. Because uh, I think the criticism I saw pointed at it, and it was, it was the attempt to sort of say to people, you're professionals who use clinical reasoning on a daily basis, reason your way through this chart as a sort of, uh, dare I use the word triage to see if this person is, is if it's going to be an essential care and, and essential service. And, and the criticism I saw pointed at it was about the, the gray area it left, the ambiguity, particularly around the word, around the word pain. I'm sure you've, you've, you've seen a lot of this yourself, um, either on social media or it's come direct to your inbox. Could you just uh, talk us through the flow chart and, and whether it's going to evolve um, uh, and how you got to where it is in its current form? Sure. Um, and I think firstly, we need to say that, you know, when people are concerned and have got raised anxieties, as we all do with this, um, with this virus, um, when you don't know what the answers are and when you don't know what to do, we often just listen to the things. We only hear the things that we really want to hear. And I think um, that was one of the problems that we had initially was that our members were wanting us to say, you must do this, you, sh you cannot do that. Um, and, I, and I think that caused a lot of, initially, a lot of anger, a lot of confusion, saying, why aren't you as a college of podiatry telling me what I should do um, and telling me should I close? And, and um, one of the real good things we felt about the flowchart was that it was able to give um, some, some um, process for individuals to think about, where am I in this? How do I go, go about um, navigating my way through this? and hopefully coming up with the right decisions. We know that there are patients out there who desperately need the care and attention and treatment of podiatrists because of their complex needs, and whether that's in the NHS or in, but in, in private practice as well. And so we know that if those patients aren't being seen by podiatrists in private practice, what will happen to them? Well, they will get infections. They will, you know, I don't need to go into all of those details because we know what they are. But, you know, the need for our podiatrists is still out there. What we've got to do as a college and as the professional organization for podiatry is be really clear with our members about accountability and where that sits um, and how accountable people are for making the decisions that they need to within their own clinical uh, sphere. Um, and, and the feedback that we've had now, I think that this has landed, that this flowchart has landed in, is that people are now, because they've been able to look through it a couple of weeks and actually understand it a bit more, that people are now feeling that it has been a help to them and it has been a guide to allow them to make the decisions that they need to from a clinical perspective. So. So it has taken a while, but I think that we are seeing that hopefully with that and with the daily updates and the guidance from uh, the Department of Health, NHS England, et cetera, and Public Health England, that we are now hopefully, um, you know, helping our members to, to feel that they have made the right decisions. Um, but I, I totally understand how difficult it was right two weeks ago when people were saying, what do I do? And looking to an organization like ours to say, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do this. But, but people have to be adult and make their own decisions on certain things as well. Um, but I, I, I think that so far, so good. And whilst it's been very difficult for people to close some of their clinics, 
And as you said, not be able to see any patients or income generate in any way, that's really very difficult. But actually, a lot of people have realized just what the professional impact and issues are. So they will get whatever support they need from us as a college of podiatry moving forward as well. Yeah, look, I have to echo those those sentiments precisely. I think, um, as uh, as I've said over the last couple of weeks, the it's been quite interesting to to see the reaction of individuals um, in our in our interactions with them. So, um, so as I, I indicated to our members, you know, we've seen. Um, a whole range of emotions ranging from frustration to anger to um, uh, to just exasperation with the whole situation and and that certainly reflects much of the earlier earlier period of um, of some of the restrictions that were being placed um, we We spoke to the members or at least uh, endeavored to try to um, reflect to the members a whole range of uh, options available to us. And one of the things that, um, well, clearly as a result of some of the concerns that were raised, particularly online, to uh, a statement that we issued about, about uh, a week ago, was that um, essentially there was concerns probably being reflected more from podiatrists interpreting that we were we were almost encouraging or forcing them to shut down. And that certainly wasn't for, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, it was genuinely meant to be a reflection that there are a range of issues that are going on um, uh, in the heads of practitioners. Um, and ultimately the role of the association is to provide the information to uh, as Steve's identified to distill that information because there is a, I mean, apart from the fact that there is an absolute, uh, an absolutely enormous amount of information that's available at the moment, it's being bombarded. And uh, in addition to that, the fact that as an organisation, we're actually taking, making a point of bombarding um, members as well, because we feel that they, they do and need to know. But the, in the processing of that, we're, we're trying to... Um, uh, condense and to distill and to simplify that information so that members are able to make informed choices about what direction they choose to go, whether it is a choice to practice, whether it is a choice to diminish their practices, whether it is a choice to close down. Our, our, our role in this, or we've always seen our role as not necessarily telling individuals what to do. That's for, that's for the registration uh, body to do. Um, and uh, in some instances, we will we will call that tune if required. But certainly in the current climate, um, that's not the case. And, and I think, again, just to reiterate the, the rapid change, um, Ian, I mean, if we were to look, and the situation is obviously different in the UK, it's a much more, um, it's much more advanced than it is here. Uh, we're certainly seeing very positive signs at a, as a, at a population level that, um, to use the, the cliché term, that the curve is being flattened. Now, there's still a long way to go, but um, there is no question that in the last week there has been a significant change to circumstances, and we're likewise seeing um, much stronger um, uh, messaging coming out of government uh, and coming out of the authorities to suggest that um, what was feared uh, a week or so ago, and that was the fear was that everybody would be shut down, what was feared a week ago would be, um, has appears to have shifted. Um, we are likely, and I, again, I'm not a, not a betting man, but um, I, I think it's highly unlikely that and certainly based on the messaging that's being received from government, um, it would appear that um, allied health, along with uh, a whole lot of um, medical, which goes without saying, doesn't look like it will be shut down. Um, I think there is every intention to, from the government to make sure that um, allied health is going to play a significant part in this because at the end of the day, we are trying to ease pressure on the hospital system. We're trying to ease pressure on the traditional routes through GP practices. 
And as a consequence, I do think that the view here is that allied health will play the role in, in supporting that. So, again, that's, that's not something that um, is coming from us. It's our job to try and interpret that and to guide that and to still give people choice because ultimately people make, will make choices about their own practice on the basis of what's the priority for them. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just follow up on that, Nella. I, 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 that's my impression in the last few days, you know, reading between the lines, I think it's highly unlikely that the government's going to direct podiatry to be closed down in Australia. I think we will, they will let us stay open. It then comes back to the college flow chart, the information you've provided for people to make their own individual decisions. Um, but I, I, I will be very surprised if the, 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 the government does direct us to close down. I might not have thought that a week ago. I, I thought it might have been inevitable a week ago, um, but I think things have shifted recently. Yeah, and look, I, and I suppose from a sorry, Steve, from a from a uh, from a, an association perspective, we're likewise trying to read the tea leaves based on the information that's being provided. Um, again, there at no point has there ever been a statement suggesting you know allied health will definitely be open and this is the way it will be, but. But part of our role is to try and interpret that. Um, but we're loath to us also give information that isn't factual. Um, it's not, not our job again. And I'm, I'm being very careful with the way I'm presenting this because I'll never say never because the, there, is, there is always the possibility of those things occurring. But at this point in time, um, I don't feel that that threat is as prominent as it was uh, seven days ago. And, and maybe just following on from that, um, you will know um, that over the next day or so, um, we have got a hospital opening in London, which was only built seven days ago um, uh, at a, a conference centre in, in East London, uh, opening tomorrow for its first patients, got up to 4,000 beds. Um, the second one is going to be opened in Manchester um, and then one in Scotland and Glasgow as well. Um, so we know that um, from an AHP, from an allied health professional point of view, podiatrists have to be part of that whole multidisciplinary team. We know that. Um, and what I've been doing, uh, spending a lot of time today doing, is preparing some work for the um, Health Education England and NHS England to make sure that they are aware of what podiatrists can and are able to do and that it's not just physiotherapists, it's not just occupational therapists who are leading some of this AHP work, that podiatrists have got such a multi-skilled um, workforce across from paediatrics right through to, to old age, surgery, MSK, all of the things that, that we all know about. But there are lots of people out there within the healthcare profession who still don't really get what podiatrists can do and what podiatrists can do in a setting like that 4,000 4, bed um, unit that's opening tomorrow. So I've been writing to the uh, chief allied health professional and, um, and the secretary of state to say, look, these are the things that our podiatrists are trained to do, are experienced in and can help whether it's in intensive care or in uh, co coronary care or whatever it may be. Um, and so we've just got to make sure that AR, our members are skilled and able to, to go into those settings, but also that they are called upon to utilize the skills that they've got because they can work in so many different areas within these hospitals. So AHPs will definitely not go away. Podiatry, podiatry won't go away. Um, and actually podiatry is needed probably more than ever now because of all of these issues that our patients are facing. So we've got to bang that drum around AHPs and make sure that it's never taken away from us that uh, the really good work that our podiatry and profession can do in situations like we've got right now. Yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, we've got the, the I'm just glancing down here at this, the questions coming in and we've got well over 100 people on and the questions are just firing in so we're definitely not going to get to all of them um one thing i will just mention there's an awful lot of chat going on in there about fhps foot health practitioners and just to the people that are making those comments continue to make them but i will not get dragged into that bullshit on this podcast so <laughs> we were going to move on and we're going to continue talking about um podiatrists and both in uk and australia could we talk a bit about what options are available to podiatrists right now so we've got scenarios where the ones who are 
you know, quite literally saving limbs in the, within the NHS, probably continue to do so. The ones in the NHS doing other roles, my understanding is that are being redeployed into, you know, other, other, other areas. We've got people in private practice who, if they're only seeing certain groups of individuals, whether it be just routine, they, they're, the right thing to do is to completely close. If it's just sports injury like me, the right thing to do is completely close. And then the question is, what, sh what's, what, what are your, what's your guidance or, or advice based on your understanding of what we, we should do? You know, we can furlough ourselves potentially, depending on whether we're a limited company or an employee or whatever our private setup is. But I believe if we're furloughed, we can't see any patients, not even the high risk ones. So there's, there's a few people in the comments saying, what if my clinic is, you know, the majority is routine, but I do have high risk patients in my private practice. Staying open just for the emergencies isn't really viable as a business. Furloughing myself perhaps allows me to financially ride this out and, and have a business at the end of it. But then furloughing myself means I'm, I'm not available for those, those kind of emergencies. It's not me in that position, but I've seen a few people in the comments that have talked about that. What, what's your take on the best way to, to play that? I, I use the word furlough and apologies, Nello, if that isn't kind of where you are in, this is my very UK bias here, but you know, you know what I mean when I use that term, I assume yeah. you guys are doing okay. something similar down there. So, yeah. yeah, what's your, what's your guys take on private practitioners that, that are stuck in that kind of place? I'll perhaps let you start with that one, Steve, because uh, our situation is is quite different. So I might I might hand to you for the moment, but I'll come back to it from our context. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, um, Ian, a lot of um, a lot of our members have been asking the same questions, and obviously, um, furloughing and and um, getting some financial support is where a lot of our members are um, thinking about right now. There are those people who are saying, well, if there's real shortages within the NHS. Can I go in and do some uh, work within the NHS? And absolutely, that, that is right. I guess some of that will be voluntary, um, and that's the issue. Uh, but but the need is in the need is there for our members to be um, to be seen and to participate in whatever way they can within uh, the NHS. And certainly, if you look at some the big hospital, the Nightingale Hospital, that's opening tomorrow. You know. Um, a lot of the leadership skills that our podiatrists have at running their own practices, running and managing staff, that's the sort of thing that they're looking for within the, uh, within the uh, Nightingale Hospital right now, people who are able to manage teams and lead people through a process, lead people through a shift. Um, and, and I think that's where a lot of our uh, members should think about utilizing their skills that they have in private practice and, and transferring those into the NHS right now. Uh, the four countries, we will see that their needs are, um, are really required. Um, uh, there are some members of ours who we know are, um, who are still um, opening their practices just to see those patients who are at risk um, and those emergency patients. But um, in general, I think most people are taking on board that uh, from private practice point of view that they are furloughing and, uh, and doing the best they can by using their skills somewhere else. Um, obviously, the, the situation is quite different here, Ian, in as much as um, uh, certainly there's been a number of services closed down in Australia for the benefit of those in the UK. Um, uh, so cafes, restaurants, uh, a whole lot of other non what would be regarded as non-essential uh, well, gathering places and services have been have been closed down. Um, certainly, there have been no allied health or medical services closed down, um, uh, including podiatry. And given the majority of our members are private practitioners, um, it's highly pertinent to them. Uh, and I suppose what's uh, what is occurring at the moment is uh, certainly what we've seen has been, if we were talk, to talk in general terms, uh, I would suggest that there's anywhere between a 30 to 50% drop in clientele for a lot of places, particularly a lot of practices, particularly um, uh, a number of metropolitan practices. Uh, again, where there are where the, the, uh, there are a range of range of options available. 
Um, but in addition to that, I think the issue of, um, to go back to that issue of uh, uh, determining what where podiatry does fit in, um, again, there is no question that uh, as a registered profession, as a skilled profession, as a, a profession that, um, unlike a lot, of, a lot of other allied health professions, um, uh, engages in a range of different uh, practices and um, and procedures that would be foreign to many other allied health professions in Australia. So um, there is a wealth of skills that uh, podiatrists hold. Um, so uh, certainly to date and certainly over the last, uh, well, certainly over the last week, we've engaged similarly with the government to, to highlight the essential nature of um, certainly some of the, the treatments that a podiatrist would provide. Um, we recognise there are some, some treatments that may not be as, uh, or may not be regarded as essential. They're important, but not necessarily essential. And so the narrative from our perspective to in, in our communication with the authorities and with government and to try and impress upon them the importance of podiatry um, uh, fundamentally uh, and it, at a really extreme level in saving limbs. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is, a, and, and it draw the extension to that in saving lives, uh, apart from the fact that it's trying to save, save uh, the, um, uh, you know, the presentation to emergency departments and otherwise the treatments that would ordinarily be able to be treated routinely by through the skills of a podiatrist. So um, that's certainly a, a similar line. Um, but as I say, the, the fundamental difference here is that there is absolutely no compulsion at this point to close their practices. Um, and I suppose what's what we're seeing occurring is the whole social distancing uh, restrictions that are being placed on individuals are prompting them to think whether they need to take up routine 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 care or otherwise we just hope that 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 doesn't have the unintended consequence of those that genuinely need care um, having to uh, think twice about their about their care because we would certainly encourage that to continue and I suppose what what we are seeing and um, again part of the discussion that we're having with government and authorities like private health, is trying to find alternative ways. So the introduction of telehealth that I mentioned earlier, um, the opportunity to at least to have some uh, monitoring uh, and consultations occurring through those means, at least provides some opportunities for practitioners to then determine whether something does need to be um, escalated and dealt with uh, as a priority um, more ma in a more manual fashion. Yeah, brilliant. So, to sort of summarise, I think if you're if you're in private if you're in private practice, but in a position where you can furlough yourself and kick back and take the eighty percent or whatever it is, then then I would do so. And your goal is to try and complete Netflix, perhaps. If you're in a position like myself where you're not seeing any patients, and you don't know. In my head, until the football clubs open up again, and until the golf tour starts again, and until the marathons start again, I'm I'm not a podiatrist anymore until, until that time happens. So you could just ride it out or uh, you could quite rightly look to help out in the NHS, not just as a podiatrist, but Matt Fitzy uh, just made a really good comment and it's gone from my feed now, which is a lot of our skills are very transferable and there are some podiatrists going into the NHS, the health service and helping, but not as, not as podiatrists, the health service have never needed, never needed help more than they do now. So we've, we've, we've got options available to us. Um, and like I say, we all have, mortgages to pay and children to feed and, and uh, concerns around that. But we are in the position of a global pandemic here. So sometimes, uh, like you say, that for, certainly from a personal point of view, the right thing for me is to socially distance myself, not get on the train to London every day, because what I, what I personally, what I do is, is nowhere near essential. Can we talk a bit about students? I really feel for students right now, um, regardless of what year of study they're in. And there was a comment way way back and i've totally lost it now and i can't remember who it was so forgive me but they were talking about they were they were intending to hire a graduate next year and now um obviously they're not too sure how that's going to work and and, and all these things what what um is in place to support students at this time i presume they're doing all their exams online um 
are they still graduating at the same time on the same timeline? Uh, perhaps Steve uh, on first on that one. Yeah, um, Ian, absolutely. We um, we're working really closely with the uh, program leads for podiatry across all of the um, universities. This is a a time when uh, students, certainly third year students, are getting to the end and thinking about their final. Uh, programs, the final uh, course work and uh, um, exams and results, etc. Um, and we're trying to work out a way which will support both our program leads in making sure that we can do the best for them, but also for our students. I know that from the work I was doing today is that um, third year students are being um, looked upon as going into uh, the NHS hospitals. Um, and actually working as podiatrists in those um, trusts um, because of their, uh, they're almost finished their, their program, but they're also, um, you know, have got the skills and the ability to, to work um, uh, as, a, as a podiatrist within the NHS. It, it's caused a great deal of concern for, for the students who, th who often thought that by, by October time this year, they will have qualified, they will be going into full-time roles, et cetera. And I, I still think that there's a lot of work needing to be done in this, in this country to make sure that whatever we do, um, it's about supporting our students through the next phase. Um, what we don't want to be seen is that our students are going in almost as cheap labor somehow and not having uh, the support that they need in the final um, year of, uh, of their uh, program. Um, and we've got to make sure that, that doesn't happen. But uh, it's, um, it's, I think, uh, a real issue for us now and one that certainly the College of Podiatry, Matt Fitzpatrick and the Clinical Senate, really working with the programme leads to make sure that we can support them and the students going through this. Students across the, across the, the, um, the world are, are struggling to know now what's, got, what's going to happen and, and podiatrists is obviously just one of those. But I think, that, um, that, that we will be a bit clearer over the next few weeks with the work of the Council of Deans as well to help us to think about what that will really look like. But all I know for now is that there are a number of people who are um, students who are going in, especially third year students who are actually going in to help out with the, um, the uh, virus in these um, hospitals. But we've got to be clear, clear that they've got the right supervision and mentorship to be able to complete their, their programs and not, as I said, being seen as an extra pair of hands just because um, they're almost finished their, their, their courses. So I, I can't give you a definite answer right now because I think there's a lot more work needing to be done, but I think watch this space and see what we do and what comes out of it over the next few weeks. Um, yeah, look, from our, our perspective, I'll be relatively brief with this one, Ian. Um, uh, look, what the, the feedback that we're getting from a number of, uh, of the universities is essentially a shutdown of the, um, of the placement programs. It's difficult at the best of time to get placements for, for students, particularly in private practice and um, uh, other institutions. But um, we're finding that completely diminished. And, uh, you know, the... the the expectation, I would presume, and I, again, I can't confirm this because I don't have uh, that closer contact with some of the universities, but um, the expectation would be that there is just an attempt to shift um, and rejuggle the program uh, in the or well, the university programs as it as it stands. Um, there's obviously a fair bit of work that is done online anyway. Uh, and most of the universities have adapted to that, but uh, it's the placement and the 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 hands-on skills and the soft skills that they would be gaining through clinics, and that is university clinics as well, um, have effect effectively been um, diminished through uh, just a, a lack of uh, a lack of capacity and a, and just a complete change in in the, the circumstances in uh, with regard to social isolating and so forth. Yeah, thanks, Nell. I look, I just. Uh, a lot of comments and questions being, being made, but just a huge shout out to Matthew and Emma who are actually answering a lot of them so we don't have to actually bring them into the live comments. But there is one question here that's probably worth a discussion. Um, it's from Aaron Bryce. Hey, Aaron. Um, and, and Aaron's asked, with a lot of podiatry, actually for those in the UK, Aaron's here in Australia, um, with a lot of 
podiatry practice is closing, which is fine, should we be obligated or responsible to advise and direct clients to other clinics who are remaining open rather than just simply say, see, see you when we reopen. Now, if, I mean, I'll, let me try and answer it from my perspective. I just think there'd be really bad practice management to not keep in touch with those people on a, on a very regular basis and tell them how you're going about when yeah. you're re reopening and those sorts of things. But um, I don't yeah. know, Nello and Steve, if you want to respond to yeah. that, that responsibility. Yeah, I'm happy to, to jump in on that one, Craig. So um, the, the other part of this is, yes, it is good practice. Um, and from a, um, in fact, I think if uh, individuals, I think we might have even issued a statement uh, a few days ago, or about a week ago, feels like a few days. Um, uh, we would have issued a statement a few days ago about uh, the obligation that individuals have in accord with the code of practice that uh, is part of their registration um, to make sure that, uh, that patients are either referred um, or they're in fact, um, uh, there is communication with alternative practitioners uh, rather than what would appear to be the case in some instances. Uh, there's a sign on the door saying, um, you know, you can call me if there's a problem or the, or just that the practice won't be open for the next whatever number of, uh, of the period. Um, so there is an obligation under the under the code of uh, code of conduct, I think it is from the from APRA, uh, to make sure that that patients are continued continued to be able to re continue to uh, receive care, even if it's not through the practitioner involved. So there should be some sort of communication occurring there. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I guess nothing more to add. I totally support what uh, Nella was saying from a, uh, as a registrant point of view, you have a professional accountability to be able to make sure that your patients are well cared for. And if they need to be referred on to another service, because your service isn't there, mm. then you should be doing that. Um, uh, it's just not, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just very straightforward for me that as an accountable professional, that's what you need to be doing. Yeah. Actually, there's just been a, an interesting comment from Kath about the UK situation where you're supposed to be furloughed, therefore not doing any work to get the payment, if I understand it correctly. So how are you supposed to stay in touch with these patients to keep them informed? Is that an issue, Steve? Um, it's an issue. We've we've had a couple of calls from uh, from uh, patients actually who's saying my my clinic is closed. What do I do? Um, and we have been able to refer those those patients on to um, to other services. But I think um, you know it is about our patients being able to contact the office or the clinic, even though it may be closed, and actually speaking to. Um, someone there and saying this is an issue for me where do you think I, I need to go or having voicemails on your clinic um, uh, answer machine to say if you have got an issue this is the person or these are the this is the place you need to go to it's all about signposting I think and uh, just making sure that um, that no one's left without um, knowing where to go for any treatment um, but we've had a we've had a number of patients who bring us up saying my my normal podiatrist clinic is closed. What do I do? Where do I go? I've got an infected toe, blah, blah, blah. So um, there, is, there is something about how we sign people, signpost people on. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, that uh, sort of answers, I think, a comment fairly early on. I think it was by Adnan Nazir, if memory serves. It was actually suggesting, is it, you know, should the college hold a list of practices that remain open uh, it sounds like you, you've got that, you're privy to that kind of information already, Steve. Yeah, we've got, we have a list of all of our practitioners and um, obviously some of them have informed us, uh, well actually a number of them have informed us that they're closed, but we still have a, we have a list of people or um, services that we can refer people on to. It may not be the nearest service, but um, at least if they are in desperation, then we are able to get them to um, somewhere which is within their vicinity. Great. Um, uh, another comment I wanted to bring up, and I think I scribbled it down as it went past my screen. I think it was by Mark, and it was from a slightly different uh, perspective. It sounded to me like he was an employee, and I don't want to put words in his mouth. I'm, I'm completely going from memory, but let's just paint the picture of an employee who's being who hasn't been furloughed. They're being dare we use the word forced to work by their employer. 
yet they're a bit uncomfortable about it. Uh, I think he, from memory, said he was immunocompromised himself. Um, what sort of, the concerns here are, I'm not comfortable. If this was my own practice, I'd be shutting it down. But because it's not, and my employer is almost telling me I need to come in, I don't want to say no, because then I may face disciplinary action. Uh, could, could you guys give comment on the kind of support you might give one of your members who found themselves in that position? Steve, I'll ask you first, just because I think from the way Mark worded it, I think he was in the UK. Yeah, um, and um, and we've had a number of calls like this, Ian, um, especially for some of our, our members who are immunosuppressed um, already. I think uh, it's very clear that from an employment relations point of view, um, I have a, a really good employment relations team who have supported our members through this and who've given them the advice that they need to um, so any member out there from the UK who is struggling with an issue like this, we have got the right people and the right services to support them in their employment around this. But, but just fundamentally, if people feel that they um, are, you know, know they're immunosuppressed or know that they are working in an area where maybe they don't have the right PPE or that they're not being supported by their line managers, then there is certainly a channel to get support to um, address that. And I would say contact um, my employment relations team and we will do everything we can to support that person through their employment issues. Yeah, look, a similar, again, <laughs> there's so much similarity here. Um, uh, it's a similar situation. We have a, we have a, we have an H, uh, human resources or HR hotline um that uh, are answering a swathe of these sorts of sorts of questions um i do note that in um in fact in the last 24 hours um there's been some um some introductions from a, a government perspective and again without going into the detail of those but and they'd certainly be able to be uh explained by our hr team um that uh employers or employees do also have uh, greater rights at the moment from a leave perspective uh, the ability to take um, unpaid leave uh, in concern if they do they are either um, contract a virus or uh, or feel threatened as such um, there are some some greater leniencies that are being uh, being expressed at the moment. So um, I'd certainly again recommend that our, our members contact our HR hotline um, and uh, certainly in the first instance they might, may contact us but we would almost invariably refer them to our hotline who have dealt with a number of these sorts of issues over the last few weeks. Yeah. Here's, an, here's an interesting question that Simon's just asked and I'm sure if you, if, if you haven't had someone ring to ask this question you're going to get it soon. And Simon's asked, and again, I don't actually think there's an answer for this. If a practitioner has had COVID-19 confirmed by a test and they recover, would that enable that practitioner to return to work? Um, well, if they've, if, if they've had the virus, they've had the test to say they've had the virus, um, and they have self-isolated, did everything that's supposed to be done and clear after 14 days, then of course that individual can return to work. Yeah, no, I think it comes down to this, this issue that we don't have an answer to yet about the reinfection rate and, and immunity and all those kinds of issues. We're just not there yet to, to give that kind of answer, but yeah. yeah I, I think, think, think if you... If, I think uh, certainly in, 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 uh, in the UK, you, you know, we're... We're waiting for GPs and nurses and doctors who are currently off with the virus to, um, you know, get cleared and get back into work again as soon as possible um, because we know there's a large percentage of staff, healthcare staff, who are um, isolating at the minute because oh, of the yeah. virus. Um, and, you know, until we get these people back, our numbers will still suffer. So it's, and, it's, and uh, it's of course, and, and of course, the hope is that they are immune to future infections and then they hopefully play a big role going down the track, but we just don't know yet. Yeah, absolutely. We don't know, but hopefully their immunities um, and the immune system will have improved greatly so that they are able to fight off the infection if it came again. But, um, but as you say, Craig, it's really very early days yet. Yeah. Yeah. I would have, I would have thought Craig, that if we take the, lo the, lo the logical, 
Sorry, Ian. I, th I thought if we take the logical extension Sorry, of that, LA, LA, you go. that if ultimately if everybody uh, becomes infected at some stage, um, is the suggestion that nobody returns to work? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention a comment, lovely comment that's just come in from Osama, who says, I guess we need to recognise we're in, in challenging times. It's new for everyone, including the, the, the professional bodies and the CEOs. Thanks ought to be passed as on as opposed to frustration. As everyone's in the same boat, we need to pull together. And, and this is what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here is population wide responses to uh, anxiety, you know, to, to the unknown. It's essentially a form of anxiety or grief that we all deal with differently. Some people uh, mm. try and see the positive and the opportunity. Other people prefer to go online and be a bit of a dickhead. Um, it depends where you sit on that spectrum, doesn't it? And um, if we, we've already talked a bit about, you know, some of the potential, let's talk, try, and, try and be positive. I, I put myself hopefully in the former camp there. And, and let's talk about what, what this may, it, it might be too soon to think positively. It might be too soon to look forward and say, you know, what good might come from this. We've already talked about the introduction of telehealth or remote consultations. And I know I see lots of people looking to sort of pivot their businesses in that way. And probably that will remain. Uh, we won't go into that in too much depth because we did an episode on that a couple of days ago. Um, but have you guys had time to probably haven't, have you had time to sit down, take stock, have a think about, the way things may change, not just for us guys, but for you guys as well. What opportunities may come from this? What does podiatry look like to you guys in the future? Perhaps the, the way it looks in 10 years, if I'd have asked you this question before Christmas, I'd have got a different answer to, the, to, to asking it to you present day. Um, Nello, I'll let you go first. Mm. Um, look, I think, I, I, I don't think it just applies to podiatry in this instance. Um, and I think, you know, if we look at it from an association perspective, yeah, absolutely, we're looking at, um, you know, opportunities to do things differently, to, uh, to review some of our practices uh, and, you know, again, manage, manage risk. I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, there are going to be opportunities come from this from a podiatry perspective. Quite clearly, uh, I think a number of the initiatives that have been moved on that, as I said earlier, would ordinarily take years to achieve um, are being achieved in a very short amount of time. I think one of the things that from our perspective and from a profession perspective is concerned is the importance during this time to look at uh, determining whether we can do some genuine evaluation on some of the activities that are occurring. Um, so if I use telehealth as an example, I think from a, uh, I mean, look, the, the, the way the government has been um, speaking to date, it's been these are temporary measures. The reality is that I suppose we're looking at them as as the thin edge of the wedge. Um, so the likelihood that that we will get some continuation of the sorts of practices and opportunities that exist in the current climate that may be able to ex be extended beyond that. I think from an association perspective um, and a profession perspective, one of the um, one of the really important components is. How do we evaluate this? How do we continue to demonstrate its worth as opposed to what's occurred at the moment is that we're relying on evidence from a range of different sources, not just podiatry. Uh, in fact, I'd argue that the evidence from a telehealth uh, and podiatry perspective is actually quite light on. Um, so we're relying on evidence from other other manual therapies to, to support um, the... Um, or from other allied health, I should say, to risk, to support the, um, the the case for for uh, um, initiatives such as telehealth. So, um, I think over the next six months, at the very least, one of the things that we probably need to be looking more closely at is is how do we um, evaluate some of these changes? How do we make sure that we try to preserve them? How do we make sure that we try to continue them in the future so that they are part of the the toolkit um, that podiatrists have got to access. And from uh, from me, I think first of all, thank you to Osama for um, being positive about uh, about the um, the feedback that we're getting and for the support. Thank you for that, Osama. I'm glad you're um, listening in tonight. Um, you know, the world will change. The world's going to change 
now because of this. We're going to all think differently. We're all going to work differently. Um, and I think in another six months, as you said, Ian, if you'd have asked us this before Christmas, the answer would be very different. Um, I think we're all going to be working very differently, both in the way that we communicate with each other, the way that we support each other, but also, you know, from my point of view, I think multidisciplinary teams and other professionals will all understand each other a lot more because of what we're currently doing and how we're working together. It's amazing how it takes something like a, the most horrible virus to bring people together to actually think this. Um, I guess another positive thing, and I hope uh, Nella will smile at this, is that you know, we have the, um, our uh, global podiatry network and it's quite interesting. I was smiling earlier when Nella was saying about how, what the similarities are between his organization and my organization. I was thinking maybe we should just join up Nello and um, I, could come, I could come and live in Australia for um, six months a year when it's sunny and then, um, and then come back here in the summertime. But, but I think, you know, Global Podiatry Network, um, we, we will, because we've all gone through this, because we have... Um, had to learn a great deal about what it's like in this pandemic. We will have learned a lot, and um, I hope it will bring our organisations closer together. Yeah. Just, just to interrupt with something not quite as relevant, I've just got a news alert on my phone. There are now one million cases in the world. <laughs> just, just came up. <laughs> so another milestone. Yeah, absolutely scary. Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is the key thing. The word global you know you put in front of the word pandemic this isn't something that that one of us is going through it's things that we're all going through and like you say these numbers are terrifying uh, each country dealing with its own things and on slightly different timelines i know but the numbers are terrifying the the stories we're getting the, the more personal individual stories the ones that really hurt me are, are story in the UK a couple of days ago about a, thir a healthy 13 year old uh, boy who, who passed away from it and what really hurt me as a father of two boys is died alone. Parents weren't even allowed in the room. What, 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 and, and I see people in the comments still talking about foot health practitioners and worried about them stealing their toenail cutting business. And I just think to myself, just please leave our podcast right now and get a grip. This is, this is so much bigger than, than that. Um, let's change the subject before I call people out individually because it's just utterly ridiculous and it's, it's <laughs> Uh, winding me up Craig any questions that we need to ask uh, specifically there's no, just well, so there, many and there's, I there's, a, there's a sort of a comment question and, and that uh, just just literally just came in now about the, um, the the daily emails that the college is sending out obviously um, Nello sending out regular emails and there's updates on the website I, Steve I do check your college site the public session for your the press releases whatever you're putting out so you can keep in touch with what's there um, but the question was, do you think that can be improved? Or the question was really like a daily live video or something that would be useful to members to show members of the college what is, what, what's being done, like a daily briefing. Um, I mean, my personal view is I'd rather you got on with the job than spend too much time telling everyone what you're doing. Um, but it's sort of, yeah, it's obviously an issue that, that, you know, can the communication be upped or does it need to be upped or... Well, um, from my point of view, I think what we're currently doing is, uh, is really good. We are taking up a lot of our daily um, hours getting all of this together. And, you know, uh, the, my comms team are doing a brilliant job at trying to decipher, as we said earlier, and pull it together in a way which meets our members' needs. But if there are things that, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go down the route of doing a video every day or, or anything like that because that's just taking us away from the day job. But if there are specific things that our members feel that we're not covering or that they would like, then just drop me an email and we'll try our best to do it. Um, mm. uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's always that whole thing, isn't it? You know, the more you give, the more you are expected to give. And I just, um, I've got to get the balance right between doing the day job and um, meeting with, you know, all, trying to get everything done from a government point of view, et cetera managing a big team but also trying to get our members um as much information as possible but if there are specific things that you think we could do better then yeah. let me know and we'll uh, we'll take them on board yeah actually i know from what i one thing i've picked up on social media is that especially in the australian context is that there's a few things different going on with telehealth reimbursements and medicare payments and people making comments that are like demanding to know what the association are doing about this 
you know, from my perspective, they'd have to be pretty stupid to think that the association wasn't actually doing that anyway and working very hard on it. Um, I, I just really want to respond to that, Nello, because it's just sort of how much time yeah. do you spend spend telling them what you're yeah. doing versus actually getting on and doing it. Um, Cause yeah. obviously a lot is going on behind the scenes, but you don't have all day every day to tell people what you're doing. Yeah. And I think, I suppose the exercise is really, I, I sort of touched on it earlier. Um, Craig is, is trying to present people with facts. It's trying to present people with what the real knowns are and the information that they need to know. Um, I mean, if it provides comfort, to them to tell them that we are you know in a meeting because we're in lots of meetings um then we'd be providing emails on a an hourly basis so i think you know to go touch also on steve's point is um yeah look i as much as i appreciate the you know the importance of providing a uh, messages in a con in a in a variety of mediums um you know, it probably takes me, you know, again, it probably takes to, to put a video together. You know, again, it's pretty, pretty lowbrow sort of stuff. But in real terms, it does take time to do. It probably takes about three or four takes. It's, uh, it's, it's effort that at the moment I think um, uh, we need to be directing elsewhere. And as I say, I think it's about we've, we've provided probably more information and we've made a point in the past and I probably at this point should give it a, a real... A shout out to my my team, not just my whole team, but in particular my marketing team, who have really um, the the communication is absolutely ramped up. We would ordinarily, in a normal week, we would be lucky to send two pieces of communication because we're concerned about bombarding members. Um, we're getting we're getting flooded with information on a normal basis. That's that's increased probably tenfold. Um, over the space of the last three weeks. So we're really trying to, to manage that and stick to what is is critical for, for members to know as opposed to trying to describe every move that we're making. You know, and I see great examples to like to use your example, Craig, um, you know, private health. Absolutely, we're in, in discussion with private health. But I think there's a perception that um, you know, we're going to have every nitty gritty conversation described when in actual fact we're having very fruitful conversations with uh, Private Healthcare Australia. Um, we again, we alerted members when we did, we did have that engagement because there is a, and bearing in mind that these organisations are also dealing with every other, other um, health organisation, professional organisation wanting to get the same answers. So there is a degree of, um, Again, if we look at it from a half glass full perspective, um, there's been an enormous amount uh, delivered and achieved and changed over the last two or three weeks. Um, uh, we are genuinely, and I, I'm no doubt the same for Steve, but we are genuinely working as quickly as we can, and we are trying to hit all those all those pressure points that we know that members are concerned about. But um, there's got to be, be a degree of trust as well that we are working on their behalf that we are that they are our prime responsibility that's what we're here for we you know the the um uh, the members are are our lifeblood and we need to make sure that we continue to, to support them um but we can only do that there, there is a limit to what we can provide and we're certainly providing everything we can mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh. yep a couple of other positives Let's keep it positive. Um, Diana, Diana Palin, to be honest, I'm enjoying the challenge of trying to do things differently and the lateral thinking that's required at the moment, unfortunate circumstance, but universally it will bring change, better sense of community, evolution in the way we're able to help people, which I think is a lovely comment. And off the back of that, Wendy asked a question. Um, it's a UK based question because Wendy, from what I can see is in the UK. Do you think insurance companies in the UK uh, although I guess it's probably the same in Australia, will appreciate what we do as podiatrists after this and raise the amount patients can claim. Um, <laughs> so I guess there's a, there's a wider question there, which is do you think the, the, the perception of, of podiatrists value, um, not just with insurance companies, with the population will, 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 will raise? Is that another positive that might come out of this? Um, what do you think, Steve? Uh, absolutely, and uh, it goes back to my discussions earlier about people not really understanding what podiatrists do and can do, 
And I think the more that we demonstrate over th this period, both with our colleagues in, in the uh, healthcare profession, but also with the general public really understanding what um, a podiatrist has been able to do to help their loved one get better or improve their health or whatever it may be, then there is a much better understanding of what podiatrists um, are all about. And it, that fits into the work that you know we're trying to do to make sure we get more people into the profession moving forward. You know, we need the general public to really understand what a podiatrist can do. Look at the wonderful different the the wonderful um, areas that people can work in, like sports, like uh, forensics, like MSK, like surgery, all of those sort of things. And we need to promote that to get more people into this profession. But I think this virus and everything attached to it will um, allow more people to understand what podiatry uh, is all about. And hopefully that will get more people into the profession because we know our workforce is a big issue for us right now. Yeah. It also fits in with a comment. I think it was Aaron Bryce might have made it earlier. I'm sorry if it wasn't, if it wasn't you, Aaron. But it was, uh, it's also an opportunity to raise awareness about our infection control standards in contrast to like beauty therapists who have been closed down at the moment. So, you know, that, well, I know, I know in, in my wife's clinic, you know, we're, we're telling patients before they come in what, what extra work we're putting in to protect them. That can only have a positive spin off in the long term. They, they realize the standards that we have. Absolutely. I, I think, um, look, I, I'm not sure I'd necessarily suggest that podiatry will necessarily gain a, a greater profile through this, although by the mere fact that it is one of the few services that it continues in the context of Australia that continues to be open. But I think your point's absolutely pertinent, Craig, is that breadth of um, skill, knowledge, um, practice that podiatrists engage in um, and infection control is a great example, I think, in, in these uncertain term, times. I think, uh, yeah, that's probably, it, it presents a point of difference to a whole lot of other, particularly allied health professions, um, that, uh, that, that probably sets it apart from, um, from the others. Yeah, my, my only negative on that, and I, I, it's probably my own personal sort of ethics or views, is I, I just feel quite reluctant to take advantage of the situation. You know, like to me, it's, let's wait till it's over and push things. Like, I, yeah. you know, you just sort of, I just feel a little uncomfortable. Um, and again, it's the, the issue of telehealth. I see people starting to promote it interstate, stuff like that. I, I, I feel very uncomfortable and awkward uh, personally do, doing that. Yeah, I, I suppose from my, from my view of that would be that, no, now is not the time to um, profiteer from that, is my view. Uh, I think we've con got to continue to present ourselves as an ethical, professional um, uh, pr uh, profession. The, the, I think it will have its, uh, its benefit beyond this. Um, I think ultimately they, they will be the sorts of things that... Um, the sorts of characteristics that the uh, the public will look to, um, they will look to safety. They will look to uh, standards that um, currently, um, well, they're probably not as acutely aware of or or um, or focused on at this point. So I suspect that that will be the opportunity going forward. Yeah. Good. Um. Nice comment from Samantha here, just saying she finds the, uh, again, she's at the UK, finds the daily emails really helpful, means that she doesn't feel quite so alone in this challenging, difficult time. And she also says it's her first visit to our podcast, Craig. So she thanks the college for emailing the, the link in one of the emails. So um, well, I, I think there's a few people, you know, we've got, yeah. we've had so many people online compared to what we normally do. I think a lot of people, it's their first time. So we would say to them, there's 70 hours of completely free CPD here. So go back through the archives. <laughs> well, yeah, we've been doing this for <laughs> a couple said, of years. We've been going for a couple of years. Where have they been? You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is it. And you know, this is the thing the first year we, we did one a week. One, one a week for the whole first year. Then we, we felt overworked, so we, we reduced to one a month. But actually, because we know that people are at home and they've got more time and, and uh, you know, we just wanted to sort of put some content out there. This is our fourth. Do you know, Craig, this is our fourth in one week. So this is a new yeah. record for us. Four <laughs> yeah. in one week is a new I know. record. 
And we've got a couple um, of exciting so ones. So we're going to try and too. get these things out. Um, <laughs> we have, yeah, we're going to try and get these things out a bit more regularly um, so that you can use this time, like we say, to improve your business, improve yourself, you know, mm. try and try and be a bit more positive about this and decide, okay, if I'm not currently working to the top of my license, uh, this is my opportunity to make sure that whatever, you know, whenever the world stops being on fire, uh, I don't just pick up where I left off, but perhaps a better, a better version of me, you know, takes over, so to speak. Um, Craig, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we're look, way we're, past the hour. I, I see Simon already commented on it. Yeah. Um, no, look, the, 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 the hour, we, can, we can keep going. The, no, and Steve, the, the issue with the time is that when any over an hour, we have the podcast version has to go into a part one and a part two. And people don't listen to a part two. So we do try to stop these at an hour or just under an hour so we can keep it to one. But I, I think this is such an important topic. We can keep going for a little bit longer if you guys are happy to stay there. But I think one, one question, one we have discussed this a bit previously. Um, are, are any members ringing up um, financial issues, asking about deferring membership fees, those kinds of issues? Um, or are people not ringing up about that yet or anything happening in that space? Um, I'm happy to go first. Uh, um, last week, uh, the college took it on board that, you know, we realized that a lot of our members were going to be struggling financially. Um, and we have agreed via account for our, our council that we will have a, um, a fee break of um, two months. So a holiday for um, two months for those people who pay over a, a direct debit. Um, and that's, we've had um, well over 500 people, I understand, who have applied for that so far. So it does show that um, our members are thinking about their finances. And um, I hope that by doing that, and we will review it and continue to review it, that um, it goes some way to help our members financially at this stage. Good, yeah. Yeah, from our perspective, Craig, I mean, certainly uh, we've had, we've certainly had some members contact us uh, and we've obviously been um, extremely sympathetic to those sorts of situations and we take them on a case by case basis. I think the way we're approaching it at this point, given we're so close to the end of the um, uh, end of the, the membership year, um, that we've got some announcements we'll be, we may, we'll be making over the next few weeks um, with regard to uh, our membership uh, and our insurance offering uh, and what members uh, look quite frankly I, I again without going into the detail because I, I don't want to release it until we've got it absolutely confirmed but uh, uh, we will make sure that members are looked after. Um, there will be enormous savings. We recognise that members, a lot of members are hurting um, and a lot of members are, are going without. Um, we want to try and obviously we want people to continue with their membership. Uh, we'll be making absolutely uh, every effort um, and I think members will appreciate the effort and the offer. Um, to make sure that members um, do continue to be part of the association. And, and perhaps the only thing to add to that is that um, I suppose these times are those that um, we would also like to think that members genuinely recognise the value of an association. Um, I mean, again, without sounding too, too opportunistic, but um, I just think that, you know, the, if these are the times that, uh, that, um, practitioners really should see the worth in their um, in their association. Um, I think it will change things um, ongoing. I think the expectations have been lifted, but um, I, I'd like to think, and I'm sure it's the same for Steve, is that I'd like to think that we've demonstrated to to everybody that there is the value in an association at this time. That particularly in our case, given we've only recently nationalised. Um, I would hate to think what the circumstances might have been if we had uh, six or seven different associations trying to coordinate this at one time. We as a national organisation now have been much, much better equipped to deliver the sorts of outcomes that, um, that members would expect from their association. And I, I doubt that would have been achieved in under an older, uh, more archaic structure. Mm. 
Perfect. I don't see anything else that's come through with any kind of urgency. I'm certain we've missed lots of questions, so I do apologise. But like I say, we're just not used to having so many people watch. We, we, the uh, the fame's <laughs> clearly got to us because even Craig's let us go beyond the hour. So I'm 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 <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm surprised he's done that. Um, let's yeah. just. No, that, that's a good note. I think, we, again, I'll shout out to both Emma and Matthew who have been answering a lot of questions as we go through so that we haven't needed to repeat. So some of them are quite, um, you know, we, at least we can focus on some of the big picture issues in our discussions and some of the more detailed questions that Emma and Matthew have been, been answering. So th thanks for that, guys. So that was probably a good, good, good note to finish. We've, it's an hour and a half. So, you know, thanks so much, Nello. Thanks so much, Perfect. Steve. Um, we have had people join late. If, if you Thank come you, gentlemen. Back, if you come back in about 10, 15 minutes, Facebook will render the video and the whole video will be here. It will be up on YouTube um, in a few hours. I just got to edit a few things um, before and after. So look, so thanks Nello and thanks Steve. It's been well worth it. Um, hi Denise, you've just joined a little bit late, but come back in 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, so um, really um, delighted to have been um, part of this this evening and uh, from a college of podiatry point of view here in the UK, really happy in any way moving forward to continue these. Um, if it's not me, certainly one of my, my team would be willing to step in, uh, but really happy to help, the, certainly over this period around the virus and everything else, really happy to do whatever we can to support our members across the globe and, and help in any way. So please just um, keep in touch with us. Yeah. Yeah, likewise, Craig. I mean, you know, again, we we certainly encourage. Uh, you know, our thoughts are certainly with our our UK uh, colleagues um, who are going through potentially a tougher time than we are at the moment. We we respect that. Um, I think that um, uh, we encourage members to contact us via a range of ways. And quite honestly, you touched on it earlier. We're likewise happy to hear criticism, um, you know, but we want to make sure we're, we're able to engage in the, the conversation and provide a, a perspective of sometimes why things occur the way they do, uh, rather than it just being um, a simple uh, binary binary uh, uh, issue. So um, our thoughts are with everybody. Uh, please uh, stay safe and you know, we, we'll happily be involved in whatever we can be in the future to help uh, dispel the myths and to support people through what is clearly a difficult time. Thank, Thank you, you too. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Very much.